This is part 4 in a video series I'm making on the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. In part 1, I went over historical methodology. If you haven't seen this video yet, I recommend that you watch it first so that you understand what I'm doing and don't attack a straw man because I cite a passage from the New Testament. I'm not doing anything different than what any non-Christian historian would do when I approach the New Testament. I'm applying the criteria of authenticity to the New Testament documents to see what we can affirm as historical, wholly apart from presupposing the inspiration or inerrancy of the New Testament. This is how historians would approach any ancient document. I also explained in that first video that I'll be using a minimal facts approach. A minimal facts approach must meet two criteria in order to be a minimal fact. It must be very well attested, that is to say it has a lot of different historical arguments in its favor, and it is nearly universally accepted by nearly all scholars who study the subject, even the, non the skeptical non-Christian scholars. In part two, I went over the evidence for that first minimal fact, that Jesus died by crucifixion. And in part three, I looked at the evidence for Jesus' tomb being found empty by a group of his women followers the Sunday following his crucifixion. In this video, let's look at that fourth minimal fact, the claim and belief of Jesus' disciples that he appeared to them alive after his death. Reason one, the early creed cited in 1 Corinthians 15. The first piece of evidence in favor of post-mortem appearances I want to look at is Paul's list of appearances in 1 Corinthians 15. Most scholars of all theological stripes agree that Paul is citing an early creed in verses 3 to 8, and that this creed dates to within five years of the crucifixion of Jesus. They also believe that Paul received this creed from the apostles Peter and James just a few years after his conversion. If these scholars are right, this provides us with early and eyewitness testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. But what does the creed say? How do we know it's a creed? How do we know it dates to within five years of the crucifixion? How do we know that Paul got it from Peter and James? Let's look at the reasons why scholars have reached these conclusions. First, this is what the creed says. Quote, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James then to all of the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born." End quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. So, how do we know that this is a creed? How do we know that this isn't just doctrine that Paul is teaching in his own words? Scholars have come to believe that this is a creed on the basis of the following reasons. 1. Paul alerts us that he's not writing in his own hand. In verse 3, Paul says outright that his words are not his own. He writes, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Paul essentially says, I received this information from someone else. I received it from someone else. It's not a list of things I came up with. Now I'm going to pass on what I've received to you. So he's outright telling us that the information he's about to cite is something he himself received and is about to pass on to his readers. Additionally, received and passed on were typical terms used by rabbis who were passing along holy tradition. Reason two is that the language in verses four to seven are non-Pauline. Now, what do I mean by non-Pauline? Well, as Michael Icona explains in his book, The Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach, quote, As examples, with a lone exception of Galatians 1-4, for our sins is absent elsewhere in Paul and the rest of the New Testament, who prefers the singular sin. The phrase, according to the scriptures, is absent elsewhere in the Pauline corpus and the New Testament, where we read, it is written. Instead of the typical aorist, the perfect passive, he has been raised, is only found 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 12 to 14, 16, 20, and in 2 Timothy 2, 8, which is also a confessional formula believed to be pre-Pauline. On the third day is only here in Paul. In Paul, the term appeared to or was seen is only found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 5 to 8 and 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. The 12 is only here in Paul. Elsewhere he uses the apostles, end quote. So in other words, what Dr. Lycona is saying here is that scholars believe that this is not Pauline material. This is something that Paul is quoting that someone else ri- uh, wrote because this is not the way Paul usually talks. These are not the phrases and the words that Paul usually uses in his epistles. They stick out like a sore thumb. Reason three is parallelism is apparent in the text. Parallelism is a type of wording that was commonly found in oral traditions. The purpose of parallelism was to aid in memorization. Parallelism involves writing several lines that go by the pattern of the first line being long, followed by a short line, followed by another long line, and then another short line. You, when you examine 1 Corinthians 15, this is exactly what you find. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, long, and he was buried, short, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, long, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, short. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time, long. Four, the fourth reason, is the repeated use of the phrase, and that, suggests this is a creed. Just as parallelism was a wording style to make memorization of creeds easier, putting a common repetitive phrase in creeds also helped aid memorization. In this case, the repetitive phrase is, and that. Depending on the English translation, you'll sometimes just see the word that. But and that is what's found in the Greek. And that he was buried. And that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And that and that and that and that. For these reasons, we have good grounds for affirming that the material cited in verses 4 to 7 are part of a creed. Paul received the creed's somewhere else, and then proceeded to cite it to his Corinthian readers. What this means is that the material in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 to 8 predates the actual writing of 1 Corinthians, which virtually all scholars date to around 55 AD. But how much earlier does this material date? Well, first of all, it certainly has to predate Paul's first visit to the Corinthian church in AD 51. Why? Because in verse 3, he uses the past tense. I passed on to you. For what I receive, I passed on to you. In the latter part of that sentence, Paul uses the past tense of pass. This implies that the information he's about to cite in his epistle is information that he already cited to the Corinthians. And since he received this creed from somewhere else, This means that the creed predates even Paul's first visit there. If this were as far back as we could go, this would still be extremely early information, since the creedal data would date no later than 20 years after Jesus' death. But as I said earlier, most scholars believe Paul got this creed directly from the apostles Peter and James just five years after his conversion. In Galatians 1, Paul is recounting his conversion from skepticism. He describes how he persecuted the church in verses 13 and 14, that God revealed his son to him in verses 15 and 16, and then he says that he went away into Arabia and then went to Damascus in verse 17. Paul then writes, quote, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him fifteen days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. End quote. Verses 18 to 19. This seems like the most likely place and time for Paul to have received the 1 Corinthians 15 Creed. First of all, two of the explicitly named individuals that appear in the creed, Peter and James, are also the two individuals Paul was talking to, 
Secondly, as New Testament historian Dr. Gary Habermas pointed out, quote, Paul's use of the verb historiasi, 118, is a term that indicates the investigation of a topic. The immediate context, both before and after, reveals this subject matter. Paul was inquiring concerning the nature of the gospel proclamation, Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 to chapter 2, verse 10, of which Jesus' resurrection was the center, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 4, and verse 14 and verse 17, Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 and verse 16, end quote. These seem like very good indications that this was indeed when and where Paul received the creed. In that case, the information in the creed dates to within just a few years of Jesus' death. By the criterion of early attestation, this makes 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 to 8 extremely reliable material. This is because there was no time whatsoever for legend or embellishment to creep in. The apostles were proclaiming that Christ rose from the dead within a mere five years of his crucifixion. The creed cited in 1 Corinthians 15 dates back so early, well within the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses, that anyone curious about whether or not Paul was telling the truth could have traveled over to Jerusalem and interviewed the people mentioned in the creed to see if they really did believe Jesus appeared to them. If Paul were lying about these people and they really hadn't seen Jesus, the cat would have been out of the bag and the resurrection would have been exposed as a falsehood. Given how fragile a faux resurrection would be in this case, the best explanation is that the twelve disciples, James, and five hundred people actually did have post-mortem Jesus experiences. In fact, some have argued that Paul is essentially daring the Corinthians to interview these people if they are in doubt by mentioning that some of them are still living, though some have fallen asleep. It's as if Paul is saying, if you don't believe that Jesus appeared to these individuals, go talk to them yourselves. Some of them have died, but some of them are still around to affirm what I've said. Reason 2 Paul had direct contact with the twelve disciples and affirmed that they claimed Jesus rose from the dead. Let's say that you don't think that the two arguments which are given in favor of Paul receiving the creed during the trip mentioned in Galatians chapter 1 verses 18 to 20 are sufficient. Nevertheless, the creed still dates to no later than 50 AD, just 20 years after the death of Jesus. The creed could have been received two years or 20 years, but no earlier and no later. So my arguments above still stand that this is an early source within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses who could have falsified the postmortem appearances if they hadn't occurred. Secondly, even if Paul didn't receive the creed in the Galatians 1 trip, we still know that he had first-hand contact with the original 12 disciples and were therefore in the perfect position to know what they believed. Paul makes two trips to Jerusalem. The first trip occurs five years after his conversion, Galatians chapter 1, verses 18 to 20, and the second one takes place more than 14 years after, in Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Paul makes two trips, and he's there at plus five years and plus 18 years after the cross. Both trips are very early, and he talks to the eyewitnesses. What are they discussing? The gospel. In chapter 2, verse 2, he specifically says, quote, I went in response to a revelation, and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain." End quote. In other words, Paul is essentially saying, I just wanted to double check and make sure that I'm preaching the same message as my fellow apostles are. I gave them the gospel I preached, and wanted to cross-reference it with the one they preach. What was the result of such an inquiry? Paul says in chapter 2, verse 6, They added nothing to my message. Then he said, quote, On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. End quote. Verses 7 to 10.
probably the best thing Paul contributes to our case is interviewing the other eyewitnesses and giving us the data. Paul said that he and the other apostles preached the same message. In Galatians 1 and 2, he's talking with the 12 disciples. And in Galatians chapter 2, verses 6 to 10, he affirms that what he's teaching is what they're teaching. If the disciples were not claiming that Christ had risen from the dead and had appeared to them, that would not be the case. Also, in 1 Corinthians 15, 11, just after citing the creed, Paul basically says, I don't care if you go to them, I don't care if you go to me, we're preaching the same message about Jesus' resurrection. Reason 3. The disciples of the disciples affirmed that they preached Jesus' resurrection. The early church fathers lived and wrote in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries. When you investigate the writings of these guys, you find that some of them had physical contact with the apostles. Given this fact, just as we can trace the disciples' teachings back to them through Paul, we can trace the teachings of the disciples back to them through some of the church fathers. The early church father Clement, who lived from 30 to 100, wrote to the Corinthian church in 95 AD. Around 185, Irenaeus gave us some extra info about this Corinthian epistle. Irenaeus wrote, quote, Clement was allotted the bishopric. This man, as he had seen the blessed apostles and had been conversant with them, might be said to have the preaching of the apostles still echoing and their traditions before his eyes. Nor was he alone, for there were many still remaining who had received instructions from the apostles. In the time of this Clement, no small dissension having occurred among the brothers at Corinth, the church in Rome dispatched a most powerful letter to the Corinthians." End quote. Around 200, the African church father Tertullian wrote, quote, For this is the manner in which the apostolic churches transmit their registers, as the church of Smyrna, which records that Polycarp was placed therein by John, as also the church of Rome, which makes Clement to have been ordained in like manner by Peter, end quote. According to Irenaeus and Tertullian, Clement engaged in fellowship with the apostles. Clement writes of their belief in the resurrection thusly, quote, Therefore, having received orders and complete certainty caused by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and believing in the word of God, they went with the Holy Spirit's certainty, preaching the good news that the kingdom of God is about to come. End quote. Clement said that the apostles believed in the resurrection of Jesus. If he knew the apostles, as Irenaeus and Tertullian say he did, Clement would be in the best position to know whether or not they were truly teaching that Christ got out of his grave. Irenaeus wrote that Polycarp knew the disciples. Irenaeus wrote, quote, But Polycarp also was not only instructed by apostles and conversed with many who had seen Christ, but was also, by apostles in Asia, appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna, whom I also saw in my early youth. For he tarried on earth a very long time, and when a very old man, gloriously and most nobly suffering martyrdom, departed this life, having always taught the things which he had learned from the apostles." Irenaeus wrote a letter to a person named Florinius. In this letter, Irenaeus also talked about Polycarp. Unfortunately, that letter is lost to the sands of time. But, while the letter itself is gone, Eusebius preserved a portion of it in his writings. Quote, When I was still a boy, I saw you in Lower Asia with Polycarp, when you had high status at the imperial court and wanted to gain his favor. I remember events from those days more clearly than those that happened recently so that I can even picture the place where the blessed Polycarp sat and conversed, his comings and goings, his character, his personal appearance, his discourses to the crowds, and how he reported his discussions with John and others who had seen the Lord. He recalled their very words that they reported about the Lord and his miracles and his teaching, things that Polycarp had heard directly from eyewitnesses of the word of life and reported in full harmony with scripture." Given the fact that Polycarp knew the apostles personally, he would have been in the best position to know what the disciples believed.
Polycarp mentioned the resurrection five times in his letter to the church in Philippi. So, through Polycarp and Clement, we can trace the claims of the resurrection right back to the disciples themselves. But, the skeptic may object, just because the disciples were claiming that Jesus rose from the dead, that doesn't mean that he actually did. Maybe the disciples were making the whole thing up. Maybe they were lying about having seen the risen Jesus. I have never found any attempt by non-Christians to make the disciples out to be bald-faced liars very convincing. This is because church history is unanimous in claiming that all of the disciples, with the possible exception of John, died brutal martyrs' deaths. Why would they die for a lie? Why would they die for something that they knew wasn't true? I could believe someone would die for a lie that they thought was true, but I can't bring myself to believe that someone would willingly die for something they knew was not true. Some of the sources that record the disciples' martyrdoms are Clement of Rome. He, Clement of Rome records the sufferings and martyrdoms of pa Peter and Paul. Polycarp. Polycarp reported the sufferings and martyrdoms of the disciples in general. Tertullian. Tertullian reported the martyrdom of Peter and Paul and specifically says that Peter was crucified and that Nero, was be uh, Nero beheaded Paul. The book of Acts. Acts reports the martyrdom of James, the son of Zebedee. He was beheaded by Herod Agrippa. And Eusebius. Eusebius says in his ecclesiastical history that all of the apostles were martyred and says, Eusebius says that Peter was crucified upside down. At this point, skeptics usually respond by saying, well, that doesn't prove anything. Other religions have martyrs. Does that mean their religious beliefs are true? Think of the terrorists who f flew planes into the World Trade Center, for example. Does the fact that these terrorists were willing to die for their religious beliefs prove that Islam is true? This, re this response simply shows that the objector has misunderstood the argument. I am not arguing that because the disciples died martyrs' deaths that this proves that Jesus rose from the dead. All I'm arguing is that their willingness to suffer and die proves that they sincerely believed what they were claiming. No one dies for something that they know is false. If they die for it, it means they sincerely believed it. Pointing out the historical evidence for their martyrdoms is not me trying to argue that the resurrection occurred. It's me trying to argue that when the disciples claimed that Jesus appeared to them, they really believed that he appeared to them. Whether or not he actually did, they certainly believed that he did. No one would say that the terrorists who flew the World Trade Center, uh, flew the planes into the World Trade Center, thought that Islam was false. If they believed it was false, those 3,000 people would still be alive today. Martyrdom doesn't, pl it doesn't prove a claim is true, it just proves the sincerity on the part of the martyrs. Liars make poor martyrs. What all of, th what all of this means is that through Paul and the Church Fathers, Polycarp and Clement, we can affirm that the twelve disciples of Jesus claimed Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to them. We have three independent sources. The Apostle Paul says that the disciples were preaching this, and he, Paul personally knew them. The Church Father Polycarp says that the disciples were preaching Jesus rose from the dead, and we have two early Church Fathers independently attesting that Polycarp knew the disciples, and Clement says that the disciples were preaching that Jesus rose from the dead, and Clement personally knew them. So we have three independent sources, Paul, Poly Polycarp, and Clement, and therefore we have multiple attestation to the claims of the disciples that Jesus rose from the dead. And we have multiple attestation that they all died brutal martyrs' deaths when they could have saved themselves by recanting. That they all died brutal martyrs' death when they could have saved themselves by recanting means that they really believed what they were claiming.
Reason 4. The postmortem appearances to the disciples are multiply attested. Jesus' after-death appearance to the Apostle Peter is independently mentioned by Paul and Luke. See 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 5 and Luke chapter 24 verse 34. Virtually all scholars agree that Paul and Luke are independent sources. Therefore, the appearance to Peter is multiply attested. The appearance to the twelve disciples is recorded by Paul, it's recorded by Luke, and it's recorded by John. See 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5, Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 53, and John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. Therefore, we have three independent sources regarding the post-mortem appearances to the disciples as a group. Again, what are the odds that three independent sources are all going to make up the same lie? On the basis of the principle of multiple attestation, we should conclude that the post-mortem appearances are a fact, however you want to explain them. Reason 5. Doubting Thomas gives us reason not to doubt. John chapter 20 verses 24 to 29 records the post-mortem appearance to Thomas. All of the other disciples had seen Jesus alive and were rejoicing at his resurrection, but Thomas was so skeptical of the resurrection that he said he wouldn't believe it until he placed his fingers in Jesus' hands and sighed. Verses later, we read that Jesus appeared to Thomas and Thomas was convinced. However, why would the writer of the Gospel of John depict Thomas in such a bad light? John 20 doesn't depict one of the apostles in a very good light by making him out to be a hard-headed skeptic, disbelieving the testimony of the rest of the apostles. It seems to me that Thomas's skepticism is unlikely to be a Christian invention on the basis of the criterion of embarrassment. Therefore, this passage is very likely to be telling us a historical fact. Now, perhaps I can play devil's advocate and propose an objection to this particular point. Maybe the reason John puts Thomas in a bad light is that he disliked Thomas. Perhaps later on they got into heated arguments, causing a rift between them. John 20's depiction of Thomas, therefore, is just slander. However, this is a possibility that has no historical evidence behind it. If the skeptic wants to undermine this fifth argument, he'll have to do more than just propose an alternative possibility. He'll have to back up that possibility with evidence. We have no reason to believe that the writer of John's Gospel, whether he's the Apostle John or someone else in the early church, Bob, the Jerusalem church janitor, uh, had, had any reason to dislike St. Thomas. No church historian hints at any tension between the Apostle John and Thomas or any disfavor of anyone in the early church towards Thomas. And no, none of Paul's writings indicate that such a tension existed. Thus, we have no reason to believe that John had anything but the utmost respect for Thomas as he did the other apostles. Reason 6. Brave Women, Cowardly Disciples Before the appearance to St. Thomas, the Gospel John reports that the risen Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene before he appeared to anyone else. And Jesus told her to, tw to tell the twelve disciples that he had risen. This is in John chapter 20, verses 11 to 18. We then read that Mary went and told the disciples what Jesus told her to tell them, but we also read in verse 19 that they were hiding in fear of the Jews. Now, the criterion of embarrassment has a lot to go on here. First of all, remember from the previous video that women that they weren't even permitted to serve as witnesses in a Jewish court of law unless there were absolutely no men available, so they absolutely had to use a woman. In light of this fact, it is astonishing that not only is a woman the first witness to the empty tomb, but also the first to see the risen Christ. If the author of the Gospel of John were simply making this narrative up, wouldn't he have a man be the first witness to the risen Christ? But, no, he couldn't do that because he wrote that the men were locked up somewhere hiding in fear of the Jewish leadership. This is also a surprising thing to mention if you're just making up a narrative whole cloth. Why would John make the men, who would include John himself, the author, if he's really the author of this book? And, of course, my case does not depend on the authorship of the Gospels. 
But if John is the author of the Gospel of John, that makes it even more powerful because he paints himself in a bad light in that case. Why would he make the men hide? He would write them hiding like a bunch of wusses and make only a woman follower of Christ have the guts to go down to the tomb. This paints the disciples in an embarrassing light and exalts a person who back then had low social status. By the criterion of embarrassment, we can conclude that this is the reason this is in there is that this is how it actually happened. But it gets even better. Look at the specific words Jesus said to Mary. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. This is verse 17. Now, everyone agrees that John's gospel puts more emphasis on the deity of Christ than any of the others. And skeptics say that John actually invented the deity of Christ, but I'm not going to argue that in this video. I'm not going to dispute that in this video. That's not my purpose here. But... Yeah, John has a very, very high Christology. And literally, in chapter 1, verse 1, he says Jesus is God and he created the whole universe. And then he became flesh and made his dwelling among us in verse 14. John's gospel puts a heavy emphasis on the deity of Christ. And yet he says that God the Father is his God. When you've told your readers from verse 1... That Jesus is God. Literally, verse 1. It's odd to have Jesus say that the Father is his God, as though Jesus is somehow an inferior being. If Jesus has a God, how can he be God? Now, just like with the, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, which we examined in video number 2, I think there is a good explanation for why Jesus said this. I don't think Jesus' words here in any way diminish his deity. However, the point here is that they seem to at face value. And rather than having to go through the trouble of explaining why Jesus said this, it would have just been much easier for John, or whoever wrote his gospel, to just omit that part altogether. The fact that it's in here gives us reason to believe that this is not made up. This is actually what Mary Magdalene heard the postmortem Jesus say. Once again, the criterion of embarrassment gives us reason to believe this account is historical. So, the criteria, in summary, the criterion of embarrassment applies to John chapter 20 in three different ways. There are three embarrassment arguments. One, a woman is the first to see the risen Jesus. In fact, she sees them. He, she sees him before any of the twelve do. Number two, the disciples are hiding like a bunch of cowards because they're afraid the big bad Pharisees are going to get them. And number three, Jesus calls the Father my God, which prima facie suggests he isn't God, in a gospel that emphasized his divinity since literally verse one. So this gives us yet another reason to believe that the twelve disciples had a post-mortem appearance experience of Jesus. Now, again, you can try to explain these by appealing to naturalistic theories if you want to, but it doesn't seem sound to deny that the disciples had post-mortem experiences altogether. They believed they saw Jesus alive. Whether you think that's actually the risen Jesus, a hallucination, or something else, and we'll get to that later in this video series, the fact is, they believed Jesus appeared to them. In conclusion, we've seen that Jesus' death by crucifixion and Jesus' empty tomb has an astounding amount of historical evidence for them, and so do the post-mortem appearances to the disciples. Again, you can try to explain these appearances in some naturalistic way, and rather than concede that Jesus really rose from the dead and stood before the disciples, but you, I don't think you have any grounds to deny that these experiences really happened. And in fact, I know some new, I know atheist New Testament scholars would agree. Look at what the agnostic historian Bar Ehrman has to say. Quote, We can say with complete certainty that some of his disciples at some later time insisted that he soon appeared to them. 
Historians, of course, have no difficulty whatsoever speaking about the belief in Jesus' resurrection, since it is a matter of public record, end quote. Look at what atheist historian Gerd Ludemann says, quote, It may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which he appeared to them as the risen Christ, end quote. Now, do we have enough evidence to conclude that Jesus rose from the dead? I, I think we do. In my experience, skeptics have a hard time coming up with a naturalistic theory that can account not only for the post-mortem appearances, but the empty tomb as well. However, I think we can make the case even stronger by examining two specific post-mortem appearance experiences, those to Paul and James. And it is these appearance, appearances that I will look at in the next video.